I'm going to talk now briefly about one of our research areas that uh, I guess we have a lot of involvement with industry in this particular area and we're very fortunate to have a large number of companies uh, wanting to be part of this work and funding this work. We call it our advanced hydrogenation technology. Hydrogenation is not something new at all, it's been around for many decades. And I think uh, one of the interesting things about hydrogen, I always see hydrogen as a, like a magical sort of um, atom, a magical element. It's very unique, it's the smallest of all atoms and that gives it very unique properties of being able to get inside other materials and move around relatively easily, um, but also do quite magic things once they're inside other materials. And so hydrogenation is all about using atoms of hydrogen inside our silicon material that makes up our solar cell and trying to use it in a wonderful way to eliminate defects and other forms of recombination that might come from contaminants and the like. Now, as I mentioned, hydrogenation has been around for, for many decades. I think what's changed in recent years is we've figured out much better than what we used to know in terms of how to control the hydrogen. Because it turns out the hydrogen atoms can take different forms inside the silicon. There's actually three different charge states it can have. A hydrogen atom is basically just a proton, but it can also have an electron with it to put it in what we call the neutral charge state, or it can have two electrons with it, which we call the negative charge state, or it can have no electrons and be the positive charge state. And these charge states that the hydrogen naturally has inside silicon um, has a huge impact on how that or how those hydrogen atoms behave and their ability to do useful things inside the silicon. And I think one of the uh, very useful things that our group has figured out how to do in recent years is how to control that charge state of the hydrogen atom. And so just to give you a bit of a feel for it, if you put the hydrogen atom in the neutral charge state when it's inside our silicon solar cells, it can actually move round more than a thousand times more easily compared to if it's not in the neutral charge state. And naturally, the hydrogen doesn't go into the neutral charge state. It always wants to go into either H plus or H minus in our solar cells. And so the ability of how to convert the hydrogen into the neutral charge state turns out to be, firstly, very, very important in terms of the ease of moving the hydrogen around. But secondly, it drastically increases the reactivity of that hydrogen. And what that means is that if you've got it in the right charge state and you've got defects inside your silicon that are causing problems, by increasing the reactivity, you make it a lot easier for that hydrogen atom to react with whatever defects it finds within the silicon. So it kind of goes hunting around inside the silicon, um, finds defects, chemically bonds to those defects and essentially removes those defects from the silicon. And so that's the topic I'm going to talk to you about now. It's a topic that I guess a lot of our industry partners have become quite excited about, the new technology that's based on this, what we call the advanced uh, hydrogenation. It's a technology that we've developed as part of an ARENA grant. So ARENA funding has been very, very important for us. It's been the source of our funding to uh, um, do the development and now commercialisation of this particular technology. So when we look at the IT uh, ITRPV predictions for where photovoltaic technology is heading. Martin's already touched on this. He's already shown that top graph there and commented on the fact that the predictions are that the PERC solar cell that was developed here at UNSW is the one that's expected to clearly dominate in the future. And that's the kind of like orangey browny sort of colour there in that uh, top graph. And by 2026, according to that, it's supposed to clearly dominate over the other technologies. Now, when you look at the high efficiency technologies that are expected to dominate in the future, there's three of them. There are these three shown here. This is the one that originated from Stanford University. This is the sun power technology now. Um, this is our perk cell technology from UNSW. And then these are all the passivated contact types of technologies like the, um, the Panasonic uh, hit cell that um, has been recently achieved the new world record with Kanaka making that type of solar cell with an even higher efficiency of over 26.3% uh, efficiency. So they're the three technologies that are expected to dominate going into the future with PERC being the dominant one. 
Now, one of the key reasons why PERC is expected to dominate overall isn't because they're higher efficiency. It's actually because they're expected to always be a lower cost technology. And part of the reason for that is that it's the only technology here that's able to use the standard P-type commercial grade wafers that all the industries are pretty much using exclusively at the moment. It's making up more than 90% of commercial manufacturing. And it's only really the perk sell out of these three technologies that can use that type of wafer. Now the problem though is that those wafers, although much cheaper, and typically only 1% of the cost of a lot of the wafers we've used traditionally in our labs, they're a lot cheaper but they're also a much lower quality. And so the challenge becomes for this type of perk cell is to how to achieve good efficiencies from those cells that can be comparable with what these other technologies can achieve. And so this is where the hydrogen can have an important role to play because the ability of hydrogen to fairly simply and easily take a very low cost, low quality P-type silicon wafer and eliminate a lot of the defects and the recombination within those wafers has the potential to transform wafers into being a similar quality to what you would normally pay orders of magnitude more for in the past. So at much lower cost, you can potentially get silicon wafers that can have similar type of quality. Now, when we're talking about P-type silicon, um, it turns out that uh, one of the key problems that makes P-type silicon worse than N-type is the fact that a lot of contaminants and a lot of defects create these energy levels within the band gap that have a much bigger impact on P-type silicon than they do N-type silicon. And when you're in P-type silicon, a lot of these energy levels are basically vacant. So they're vacant so that electrons from the conduction band can jump into those energy levels on their way to re recombining with a hole from the valence band. And so the job of hydrogen is to get inside the silicon, hunt down these types of defects that exist and try and passivate them so they no longer contribute to degrading the performance of your solar cells. Now to enable hydrogen to do that, you do need to control the charge state of those hydrogen atoms because it doesn't happen naturally. So in P-type silicon, most of these defects here are all positively charged. And in P-type silicon, 99.99999% of all the hydrogen will be positively charged hydrogen. In other words, H plus in the positive charge state. And so those hydrogen atoms effectively aren't able to bond to the positively charged defects. And so there's a fundamental problem there in trying to get good passivation of these types of defects within the silicon or the P-type silicon material. However, if you're able to control the charge state of the hydrogen atoms and convert it to the H naught or the H minus so that the hydrogen atoms then have electrons with them, then it drastically changes the reactivity of that hydrogen and it makes it then favourable to start forming HBO and therefore passivate things like boron oxygen defects. And one of the earlier ways that we developed several years ago of how to control the charge state of the hydrogen was to simply use illumination or increased injection levels as a way of doing that. And this is some modelling done by um, some people in our team, people like uh, Brett Hallam and um, Phil Hamer. They've done a lot of good modelling of, um, of all of this. There's a very sound mathematical basis to the charge state of the hydrogen atoms and, um, and what determines them. And so a lot of the early technology we de developed was based on using these sorts of illumination techniques to control the charge state of the hydrogen and therefore improve the ability of the hydrogen atoms to uh, passivate the silicon. We now have a whole range of um, new approaches, um, better techniques for controlling the charge state of the uh, hydrogen that's turning out to be very important in some of our newer work, particularly when addressing some of the light-induced degradation that's happening in uh, the modern-day types of PERC solar cells. So it turns out that probably the most important defect to fix up in um, P-type Tchaikovsky silicon, which is the main way for being used at the moment for doing PERC solar cells, it turns out the uh, boron oxygen defect is the one that really needs to be passivated. It degrades the lifetimes a lot, creates an instability that gives you light-induced degradation. And fortunately, it's a very easy defect for hydrogen to passivate if it's in the right charge state. And because you've only got one main defect to passivate, 
then controlling the hydrogen to do that effectively is relatively easily, easily done. And so what you'll see here is a photoluminescent image. What you see here on the left is showing the open circuit voltage of a PERC solar cell that's come off a, a production line of one of our industry partners. And then on the horizontal axis, you've got time. Um, it's normalised, um, but one on here represents about uh, four or five seconds. And uh, what you will see happen is that we take the P-type Tchaikovsky silicon solar cell, we illuminate it with high intensity light, and what that initially does is it actually generates all the Born oxygen defects. So you see the actual quality of the silicon degrade very rapidly as that happens, and you'll see that with the peel image darkening, you'll see the voltage there fall, but then the hydrogen passivation takes over, the same high intensity illumination converts the charge state of the hydrogen to H0, makes it very reactive, very mobile, able to move around to where the boron oxygen defects are, and you'll see the passivation process take over and fix up all the problems that the light induced degradation was causing. So you'll see that happen right now. So you can see the voltage of the solar cell falling very substantially and now improving as the hydrogen passivates the defects and you can see the PL image now recovering. One of the very interesting things is that the, uh, the voltage of the solar cells ended up almost 10 millivolts higher than what it started when it was manufactured on the PERC production line and you'll see the PL image is correspondingly brighter now. And uh, what we believe is happening there is that the hydrogen isn't just fixing up the boron oxygen defects, um, but it's also fixing up other forms of recombination that are within these devices and, and we're not even necessarily sure what those forms of recombination are. So the hydrogen's able to passivate, I guess, all sorts of types of defects that are in there. So this is something that, um, oops, sorry. This is something that uh, lends itself very nicely to be able to be turned into a, a commercial reality because the actual process involved is relatively simple. So I've been working with several companies um, in Taiwan, China, Germany, and uh, developing some new tools to implement this uh, commercially. And these are three examples. So this is a, uh, a tool that's been built by a Taiwanese company, Asia Neotech. Um, up the top left corner, it's one produced by a, a laser-based company in China, and then the top right, it's another Chinese company that produces belt furnaces, a company called Kalong Wei, that have also produced an implementation of um, the, the hydrogen passivation technology associated specifically with solving those boron oxygen defects. And this is testing of those tools. So we've uh, evaluated all those tools under a range of different processing conditions. And just very briefly, the results are shown there compared to the bottom curve, which is the control cell. If it's not hydrogen passivated, you can see the degradation that occurs. All the other treatments, even though there's some variation in the processing uh, conditions used, you'll notice that all of them are uh, performing um, extremely well compared to the control cell where there was no hydrogen passivation. So we've applied this to product produced by eight of our industry partners on eight different PERC production lines. And we've made measurements as to the improvements that we can get if we hydrogenate cells compared to if they're not hydrogenated and then we light soak them to uh, evaluate the light induced degradation. The average performance increase is 1.1%. This is absolute performance increase. Uh, that represents about uh, a 5 or 6% improvement in uh, performance. And to illustrate what's happening there, if you look at the top right hand curve here or graph here, on the left you'll see a a, a group of solar cells as they've been received from a commercial production line and they're randomly split into two groups. One group is hydrogen passivated using the equivalent of what you just saw in those commercial tools that have been produced and you'll see the efficiencies of those shown in red. The efficiencies have gone up about 0.3% absolute on average. And then when you light soak those to accelerate the light induced degradation formation you'll very importantly see that they're staying stable. They're not degrading. So in other words, light induced degradation has been solved. Whereas the other half the cells that didn't receive that treatment, straight off the production line, the PERC production line, 
When you light soak those, you can see that their performance drops drastically. So these are two groups of cells, identical, randomly split into two groups, and after these treatments, you can see there's a huge difference in the performance and the stability of the respective solar cells. So it's a process that works well, and this is something that's now being implemented onto um, all the PERC production lines around the world. I think something that's um, a very nice little visual demonstration of all of this is uh, what you see here is a UMG silicon wafer. It's been produced with very low purity silicon by one of our industry partners. So it's called UMG silicon, meaning it's upgraded metallurgical grade silicon. Hasn't been through the Siemens process. We don't even know what it's got in it, but it's got very lousy lifetime, very poor quality. And so when we take one of these wafers and clean it up and coat it with silicon nitride, which is our hydrogen source, so silicon nitride on both surfaces, and give it the standard industry hydrogenation process, which helped a bit, it actually took the lifetimes here up to something like 10 microseconds. Okay, still too poor to make a decent solar cell out of, but much better than the one microsecond the material started with. So if you take that, and it's now got a lot of hydrogen inside it because we've already heated it to high temperature to drive the hydrogen inside it. But the important thing that we then do is we use a laser to then control the charge state of those hydrogen atoms. And that's what we do on the right. So the, solar, the, the silicon wafer from the left is heated to 250 degrees and a laser is used to illuminate just the circular region you see there to convert the H plus into either H naught or H minus. And as it does so, you can see the drastic change that it makes in the material quality. The drastic change it makes in passivating all the defects and recombination. And so the lifetime increases from about 10 microseconds up to about a millisecond, which is basically as good as any of the highest quality commercial grade P-type silicon wafers that can be bought on the market. And probably just as importantly, it's stable. No more light induced degradation. So that's a nice little demonstration, I guess, in a very visual way that shows the importance of controlling the charge state of those hydrogen atoms. Um, we've got um, a, a suite of patents that were filed for. Uh, the good news is over the last 12 months, they've been awarded in all the major um, countries now, so US, Europe, China. So all of these um, patents have now uh, been awarded. And that's something that's particularly important for all of our industry partners who uh, have the rights to uh, use this technology in their manufacturing. Now this also works for N-type. We haven't done nearly as much work on N-type, but um, Kath took uh, one of the fairly good quality N-type wafers that one of our industry partners supplied us with. And you see the PL image in the top left-hand corner there. And again, she just... Uh, treated it to control the charge state of the hydrogen just in that circular region there, and you can see the difference it made. It took the material from about one millisecond lifetime up to about two millisecond lifetime. So we haven't done a lot on N-type, but a lot of these techniques, techniques are also applicable to N-type. Now, with people doing predictions, I think the Bloomberg predictions, um, Martin's talked about some of them, but one of the very interesting th things is what they predict in terms of the future for PERC, because they're far more bullish about the PERC. Um, they've given a couple of presentations just recently where they've re-evaluated things, and, and one of the reasons for that is they've said that the hydrogenation technology has shown the potential to make a big difference to P-type and enable it to do a lot better, and therefore the PERCs to do a lot better than originally um, thought, likely. And so what you see here, if you look at 2025 and compare it to what we saw earlier from the ITRPV, You'll notice now that these two competing technologies here are now, according to Bloomberg, only expected to make up about 15% market share in combination, both under 10%, and perks to totally dominate the markets um, in the coming years. And the other very interesting thing looking at this is if you look at the present point in time, you'll see the total dominance of the green at the top. That's multi-crystalline silicon wafers. And the multi-crystalline silicon wafers are the ones that the, most of our industry partners would prefer to use, but don't feel they can at the moment because in going to PERC, the multi-wafers have a terrible light-induced degradation associated with them. There's a lot of study of these defects taking place around the world at the moment. 
Um, a lot of R&D being done, a lot of reports, a lot of papers. Um, we believe that we've identified what the defect is. It's creating that light-induced degradation. But it's creating a lot of confusion in the world and even more confusion when people try and um, measure and analyse the impact that that light-induced degradation is, uh, is likely to have. Um, but that's one of the key reasons that a lot of our industry partners are not turning to P-type multi-perk cells and instead are going to mono-perk cells in moving to the perk technology. But clearly seen here, 85% of all production at the moment are multi-crystalline silicon wafers. So this is a, a, an important, important issue to solve. And I think one of the things that's really confused it is the fact that on the one hand, hydrogen has the potential to do such wonderful things, fixing up defects and recombination and making your wafers much higher in quality. But what's confusing people is the fact that hydrogen can also react internally within the silicon in a way to actually degrade the silicon. In other words, activate some forms of recombination that weren't previously recombination active. We call it the defect X, and we believe we know what it is, um, but that at the moment is um, the privileged knowledge, I guess, of our industry partners that are funding our work. Um, but defect X normally is dormant, it's only when the hydrogen activates it within the silicon that becomes recombination active and it has quite devastating consequences. It's very easy for a multi-perk cell to degrade 10% or more when it's exposed to light under operating conditions in the field. And uh, it's actually hydrogen that's activating that. So if you never stick any hydrogen in your silicon, you will never see that form of LID in your wafers. And that's tests that various people have done now and, and confirmed that take away the hydrogen, your LID problem goes away. However, that's not a good solution because if you take away the hydrogen, you lose all of its abilities to passivate the silicon and improve its quality very, very substantially. And so what the real secret we believe is, is properly controlling the hydrogen because when you do, you can not only get all the benefits of passivating all the defects, etc., but you can avoid the problem of activating the defects that create the recombination or the LID in multi, or if you do get it, it can essentially fix up that problem. So hydrogen is the answer to that form of LID as well. And so that's become, I guess, the highest priority of our work now and for all of our industry partners is coming up with a commercial solution to that LID in multi. So we've demonstrated in the lab that we can solve it, the challenge for us is to turn that into a manufacturable process in the same way as we did for solving all the problem with the boron oxygen defects with the um, P-type Chukrowski. So multi is uh, actually a far more interesting area. Um, now that we understand what the defect is, um, we've shown that you can also put it... So that's, that's the typical degradation curve and regeneration curve that you see with multi cells and the LID in multi. And this can be linked to the way the wafer is made, but it can also be process induced. And we've actually shown that you can put this defect into the very highest quality wafers, both N-type and P-type. And so in the next slide here, you'll see we've got a very high quality gallium doped single crystal silicon wafer. We've got a very high quality float zone P-type single crystal silicon wafer, and we've got a standard multi wafer. And you'll see that we've essentially put the identical defect. So the, so the multi's got the standard defect that everyone recognises as LID, and you can see that we've been able to put the identical defects into these other types of wafers. And I think one of the things that we've realised is the case that isn't well understood in the industry is the fact that there's, it manifests itself as two different types of defect, even though they're related to each other. So we call this the type one defect, that's what we're just seeing, the standard sort of degradation and then regeneration. What a lot of people don't realise is that that then evolves into a second type of defect that it's actually more damaging in the long run because it's an effect you will see over 10, 20, 10 to 20 years in the field during operation. And that's what you see in the top right hand one there. And it's quite interesting the way the timing works out because if you superimpose those two graphs, you'll notice that the timing is somewhat related. And that's actually because what seems to happen is the type 1 defect actually evolves into the type 2 defect. And so as you see the red curve starting to recover, you see the black curve starting to deteriorate 
as the type 1 defects actually disappear and evolve into the type 2 defect. Now a lot of other people have actually seen this in their data but haven't recognised it for what it is or haven't given it a name. And so for example, here's a publication coming from Constance University and they're all focused on this deterioration and then this recovery process. Um, you can see this is in, this is like 100 hours here and this is treatment at 250 degrees. And what they haven't focused on is what comes in the next 1,000 hours at 250 degrees after that. And it's that gradual degradation that people have tended to ignore, but they're the ones that are going to be impacting people's modules in 10 to 20 years, and that's what we call the type 2 defect. And again, hydrogen holds the answer for how to fix up these defects, but only if the charge state of the hydrogen is properly controlled. And so again, just to give a bit of an example here, um, similar to before, we've got a PL image here. We're going to show here the treatment of accelerating the formation of this LID and then the hydrogen's ability to recover that and regenerate the cell. So you'll see a similar thing to what I showed earlier with the boron oxygen defects. And you can see the voltage up the top there. These are sunrise cells coming from their perk production line. And you can see it now recovering as the, as the hydrogen is fixing up the problem. But you see, what you're seeing there is the hydrogen's ability to fix up the type 1 defect only. Right? And this actually then evolves into the type 2 defect, which is actually nastier. And so here's some uh, material that Kath's put together. Kath's done a lot of work on this. I think Kath's, uh, Kath's become very much the world expert on LID. Oh, sorry for embarrassing you there, Kath. This is Kath sitting down here, the front here, that's very red in the face at the moment. Um, I preferred how she looked yesterday in the photo booths when her face was every colour under the sun. Fantastic photos. Anyway, sorry to embarrass you. And, um, and we're very lucky also to have Brett in our group. I think Brett's the world expert on boron oxygen defects and solving them. Um, we have a great team working on all of this stuff and we've added Brett, uh, sorry, Bram to our team now who I think is the world expert on passivation of rear P-type surfaces for perk cells. So uh, I think we're... Um, See, Bram doesn't go red in the face like you do, Kath, I think. <laughs> See, Bram won his international award. He's getting used to this. So Bram's great, great acquisition to our team. So we've got a great team working on all of this stuff. But this is some stuff that Kath's put together. The blue here, curve, is the normal sort of degradation you get in the multi. Um, Q-Cells has done a lot of very good work trying to solve this, but they don't know what the defect is. They've just tried to come up with an engineering solution that works. And they've developed some optimised firing um, and you can see the sort of orangey or browny sort of coloured round circles there showing what happens with the Q-cells process when you light soak them. So the degradation is greatly reduced. Kath then came up with a, a laser hydrogenation process that showed further improvement over the Q-cells approach and that's shown in the green. And then the top one, the reddy burgundy colour one, that's when Kath takes the Q-cells solution and, and adds to that her solution using the laser hydrogenation and comes up with something that I guess has been published to be the best solution yet to the LID in multi. But one of the problems is that's all just solving the type 1 defect, not the type 2 defect. And so that same cell that looks so good there and people are recognising as a good solution to it, if you then keep light soaking it, keep accelerated testing it, so you're now looking at what will happen going years into the future, you can see that it's now starting to degrade and we zoom in a bit on that and you can see quite clearly we've got the type 2 defects starting, uh, starting to come into that. And so one of the key things that we're, our team's been looking at is how to more effectively test the multi-perk solar cells so that people are more aware of this type 2 defect that exists and come up with some tests that will show that it, it, its presence. And so again, Cass done a lot of work at looking, accelerating the formation of these defects. So we start here with a standard control cell with a degradation and regeneration that you get. And then what she does is use a bit of a dark anneal at, at elevated temperature to accelerate a lot of the formation. And so when she does that, you'll see that she's managed to accelerate everything a little bit there. Then she does it a little bit more with a little bit more dark anneal, gradually increasing the temperature a bit. And then a bit more again, and you can see um, how everything's happening a bit faster now. 
And then very interestingly, it starts to evolve into the type 2 defect coming into it. And so um, that one's still looking okay. And then all of a sudden, with just a little more um, dark annealing, and you can suddenly see the curve drastically change as the type 1 defect evolves very rapidly into the type 2 defect and stays very bad for a very long period of time. And as you add more and more dark anneal, you can actually totally eliminate the type 1 defect, so you jump straight past the type 1 defect, straight into the type 2 defect that you're seeing in that top curve there. And we've done a range of things, I guess, looking at how to um, develop the types of tests that our industry partners are comfortable with that can highlight the presence of, of these defects, but more importantly, highlight when you've solved the problem. And so that's some of the work that we've been doing lately. And this uh, next slide here is showing you some of the uh, treatments and some of the demonstrations that can show when we've been able to uh, solve these tests. So we've got a test that we get our industry partners to now do that we've demonstrated here. Ali's had a lot of fun working on modules here, along with Daniel and, and others. And we're taking standard commercial modules. It doesn't matter who made them because essentially this can be any. There's a lot of modules out there that are claimed to be LID from multi. None of them are. They all suffer from the type 2 defect because I think none of the companies know the type 2 defects exist. And uh, so you can take any of those modules and give a, a test where you basically take the lamination temperature of 150 degrees and you dark anneal your module for five to ten hours at that temperature and that accelerates the onset, uh, onset of the type 2 defect and you can do that to what I think is any multi-perk module on the market and you'll see it degrade. So it's very interesting, Ali's had um, some fun with this. This is our, uh, we used our laminator to do the dark anneals, the five or ten hour dark anneal at 150 degrees. Um, this is our light soaking setup here that you see on the right hand side. And uh, here's uh, a module that um, we've given the dark anneal to to accelerate it all and that we're ready to do the LID testing on. And these are different cells and the different cells are responding differently. Um, and the one you're seeing, the, the blue one there, you can see the PL images for that cell shown here with uh, just standard light soaking that's done after that dark anneal. So it's a very interesting area. It's one that our team's really enjoying working on because we believe we know what the defect is and, uh, and how to solve it. But uh, multi in general, I think, is, is far more challenging because there's so many different types of defects that need to be solved. And this is just giving you a bit of a feel for, we can take, again, this is silicon that's not semiconductor grade silicon, it's UMG silicon, and putting it through a range of different hydrogenation processes, etc and showing how good you can eventually make that material. Now this is all tedious work, it's all been optimised for this one particular wafer. It's not manufacturable, our challenge is to turn all of this into a manufacturable processes and that's where we're working with our industry partners to uh, try and make that a reality. And it works a similar way on cells, so you can take a, a reject solar cell, it's just a, a full area ALBSF cell, and we do a range of different hydrogen passivation processes and can end up turning it into being just as good as all the high quality silicon wafers that were being used and made into solar cells at the same time. Um, we believe we've got a very strong patent portfolio protecting this technology um, in all the different countries and that's a, our industry partners place a lot of importance um, on protecting the technology. We've got an six new patents um, this year that all focus on the LID in multi and that type of defect that we believe we've identified what it is and how to solve that one. So that's what the focus is of these uh, six new patents here. So just in finishing off, um, the hydrogen we believe can be magic. Uh, it's got enormous potential to pretty much fix up any type of defect. The challenge is to do it in a way that makes it manufacturable, something where it can be done very high speed, very high throughput in a fairly simple way. And because you've got so many different types of defects, that's where the challenge lies because you tend to need a little bit different condition for each different type of defect. So boron oxygen defects, that's easy. LID multi, I think we'll be able to fix that fairly easily. When you get to the huge diversity of types of defects in some multi-materials and lower quality materials, a lot more challenging to turn it into something manufacturable. But um, 
we will certainly try. So uh, that uh, brings it to an end and a special thanks to all our industry partners that are funding our work. This is some of them, some of them don't want to be named, but we're very fortunate to have this sort of support. And uh, thank you all for your attention. <laughs>